Thank you and good morning. All set, Pete. Uh, this is the tale of three valleys and three Pete's. Peter Michael was a young man when his father began taking him around Europe, showing him the finest chateaus. And this was the start of a dream that culminated with his purchase of a property in Knights Valley in Sonoma County and the creation of his own winery, Peter Michael Winery. Peter Michael sees himself as an extension of the wave that swept over three valleys, first Silicon Valley, then Napa Valley, and of late, Knights Valley, his home. Raised in the UK, Pete was an entrepreneurial electronics en engineer when he came to Silicon Valley in 1972 at the age of 34. A year later, he and partners formed Quantel, an electronics company whose signature product, Paintbox, was at the forefront of the conversion of television and movie graphics and special effects production. Don't ask me to explain it, but I know it's important because it set a new industry standard. It was during this time in Silicon Valley that Pete began to tour Napa and Sonoma and discovered the beauty of the countryside, the excitement of the wines, and then he saw a possibility of maybe creating something of his own. And he began a search for a property that ended in 1982. So at the age of 44, he bought a uh, sprawling 600-acre uh, cattle ranch in Knights Valley, which is on the other side of Mount St. Helena. Many people consider Knights Valley an extension of Napa Valley, but of course it's not. Uh, so the Sugarloaf Ranch is now where he makes most of his wines. He makes about a dozen. All but uh, one are estate made. So in 1983, he started his winery, he and Lady Michael. In 1987, he hired Helen Turley as his first winemaker. And she bought some grapes from the Gower Ranch in Alexander Valley for their first wine. Today, Peter Michael makes uh, a dozen wines each year. They're uniformly among the, the finest in California, and therefore the world. Uh, extremely high quality across the board. You can almost be assured that if you buy a, or drink a bottle of Peter Michael, it's going to be an extraordinary experience. He and Maggie spend their summers at their Knights Valley property, where he becomes known as Pete, a more casual a ca more casual Pete. In 1989, he became Sir Peter Michael when he was knighted by the Queen for the prosperity spawned by his work. Uh, this is an exciting and unusual tasting for us because uh, we have five different wines, uh, most of them from one property, but it'll show the diversity of, of the, the Peter Michael estate. So. Uh, the different elevations, the different exposures, you're going to be seeing pictures, uh, maps, and uh, he's got, he, Peter's always goes to great detail with everything, so I'm expecting it to be that way. So uh, the final wine we have this morning is the debut of his new wine, which is from Napa Valley, and he decided that he wanted to share it with you for the first pouring. Pete? Uh, uh, Jim, thanks. It's a terrific introduction. Um, yeah, I was, I was knighted, Majesty the Queen, 1989, Midsummer's Day. And since then, my friends have called me the shortest knight of the year. <laughs> so, uh, it was raining in London, 1972. Harold Wilson, the socialist fraud, had been Prime Minister. He'd put income tax up to 98%, and my father had left for France. So, under those circumstances, a reasonably young man, I came to America and embraced the Golden State. Of course, it was technology then. I'm an engineer. And so, we had a business in 
Silicon Valley, and I rapidly determined that the inhabitants of Silicon Valley are largely lunatics. <laughs> so in order to uh, maintain my sanity, although my wife doesn't quite agree with that, she, uh, we went up across the Golden Gate Bridge and explored Marin and the northern counties and decided that this was a beautiful place and decided too that one day we would find a patch of land, a piece of California for our family for the future. But we didn't know what it was going to be. We didn't know where it was. Skip a few years, 1976, and I had been in love with a woman called Peggy Lee. And Peggy Lee uh, had accompanied me through my university career. I listened to her music. I thought she was wonderful. And there I was in Silicon Valley, and she had an engagement at the Fairmont Hotel on Knob Hill. So I gathered together a few guys, and we went to this marvelous cabaret dinner evening. And uh, it, they were superb. And at the, at the cabaret, she was wonderful. But at the dinner, I ordered, of course, uh, those years, forgive me, a burgundy, and it had been sitting in a railway station for six weeks at 100 degrees. <laughs> and uh, so I said to the sommelier, much as I might in Spain, um, what do you locals drink? And uh, he said, I think I can find you something, sir. And uh, he did. And he came up with a bottle of Chateau Montalena. Remember the year? It was 1976. That night, I was knocked over by two things, the woman and the wine. And then a few months later, the judgment of Paris. You know all about that. You know the story of Stephen Sparry and George Tabor. And on this picture, which hangs, this is a mural 20 feet long at the vineyard of Stockcross in the UK, there is a shadow in the far left-hand corner with my Panama hat. I wasn't there then, but I was there when it was repeated 30 years later. And so, at that point, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my patch of land that I was going to buy, and started in 76 looking for something we could turn into a vineyard, have a project, live a great life in, the, in this Californian climate, everything California. The best, a state with the best, and not always the best, but we embraced the good bits. And so, I followed a Scotsman, his footsteps, Robert Louis Stevenson. And he, he traveled the whole of Napa Valley, wrote about it in Silverado squatters, squatters, and ended up in Knights Valley, which he discovered. And as you drive up the Napa Valley, you see this magnificent mountain in front of you. It's nearly a mile high. When you lift off from San Francisco Airport in a helicopter, and you look north 100 miles, you see this mountain. It's on the skyline. And so I was drawn to it. You couldn't buy anything in the Napa Valley. Even then, it changed hands amongst the, uh, the locals. But here in Knights Valley, there was land. There was no winery. There were very few grapes, actually, then. Beringer was there. And uh, in those days, Knights Valley, in the 1880s, had had uh, grapes. They'd grown. But they were on the valley floor. And I think cows usually go on the valley floor in Europe anyway. You put grapes on the mountain. So that is how we decided we wanted a patch of land which was mountainous to give us some good, a good chance. The, um, the time I was there, this mountain, Robert Louis Stevenson's mountain, where he spent the summer of 1880, and he married Fanny Osborne his great love, an American girl who lived locally. And he lived there. And that whole of that estate, there's 40,000 acres of the Robert Louis Stevenson State Park. Now, he used that mountain as the model for Spyglass Hill in Treasure Island. He also, the, the many people believe that the profile of the top of it resembles a, a beautiful woman. Now, you don't get it? Well, do you get it now? 
So this has been a, this is a story of mountain vineyards and beautiful women. We're showing these five wines today. They're all babies. They're all young. They're sensual. And the women that enter into this story, some of them were young and sensual and more. So the painting we just saw was by a man called Virgil Williams, who was a great California painter. He painted, first of all, the mountain we saw, which hangs in the St. Helena Museum. But this is a really famous painting in the de Young Museum. And he's painted his wife, Dora, who was the only witness at Robert Louis Stevenson's marriage. Dora's sitting there on the white horse, surveying the west. And she is looking down on a piece of land which has got a valley in it and a great degree of forestry. And that forestry is an area which turns out to have been a cattle ranch. And there were 200 head of cattle there then. But 100 years later, that land turned into Le Pavo vineyards that I planted in 1983. But I don't want to spend too much time on that right now because we're coming back to that one. I just want to talk about this wine, La Carriere. And the La Carriere vineyard, you can see the steepness of it. La Carriere, the quarry, it's stony, it's steep. And this is part of the credo. Mountain vineyards, mountains, you can never tame them, but if they like you, they will produce the most wonderful gifts. And this was a gift. We didn't know it was there. The whole of that area was forested, and you can see the surrounding forestry. And it just be, below it, there is a, a serpentine piece, a straight line of serpentine where nothing grows. And above it, there is more rocks, and it gets very, very steep. But there, it threw up a few acres, which became La Carriere. And the miracle is that we are growing at the lower level hugely great fruit for Les Pavots, Cabernet Sauvignon. But just a little way away, we're growing a Burgundian grape and a Chardonnay, which requires a completely different climate. So how does that happen? And the miracle is this marine cooling. 30 miles away, the Pacific sends a breeze, and it comes through the gap in the hills. You can just about see in this, this picture. It comes through the vineyard and escapes over the top of the hill. And that keeps this vineyard a few degrees cooler and allows us to grow this Chardonnay at this sort of quality. There is another shot of it and uh, the shot of the mountain. That mountain, incidentally, if you just go back one, um, is an area which has got a great degree of wildlife. Now, but look at the mountain from another point of view. It's huge, it's craggy, and it's a perfect habitat for the wildlife that's coming next. It's also a perfect habitat, a great place for California's biggest, biggest cash crop. And I'm, after many years, I've become quite convinced that when the wind's in the right direction, <laughs> some, of that, some of that comes towards the carrier. And a few molecules of it stick to that waxy substance <laughs> on the surface of the grapes. And that imbues this wine with a level of effect, an emotional effect, which is very, very interesting. It changes people's emotions. So the wildlife, the safari park, the mountain lions, they're there. We had three at the lake drinking. And we also have um, a bear, a bear family, Bruno. And uh, actually, the, the, the bear is quite useful in many ways. There's nothing you can do to stop it. He tears down the, the deer fencing when he's hungry, waits for the red grapes to get ripe. And he goes in there, and he's eating away handfuls of them. You can't do anything about it at all. But what it does do, it wakes up our winemaker. And the winemaker, who's having a quiet cup of coffee, gets a phone call that says, 
there's bears in the vineyard, Nick. And he said, ah, today's the day we're going to pick the, <laughs> the Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> Actually, that's Brunhilde. She's got a cub with her. The, the bird on the top left-hand corner, if you know what it is, it's the fastest animal or creature in the, in the world. It's a peregrine falcon, dives at 150 miles per hour, and it keeps all of the little birds away. We don't have to bird net. And that is a huge advantage that comes with this. Lots of other gifts come from mountains. The frost rolls down. The frost is 20 or 30 foot thick, and it just rolls to the valley floor, and we donate that to Beringer. who, incidentally, make a very, very nice Cabernet Sauvignon on the valley floor. But, of course, the biggest risk of all is fire. Fire. We've had half a dozen fires since we've been there, and since the 1980s. And we've been fortunate. It, there's nothing you can do other than have fire drills. We put great swaths of fire break around the vineyards. But from that fire, that particular one, the cinders were traveling 1,000 feet and there's very little you can do about that to stop it. You just have to be prepared. So fire drills, number one priority for the whole team. That actually happened May the 1st this year. And uh, it just shows you, maybe I said something to upset Ma Mount St. Helena and its gods, because the night of May the 1st, wonderful night, warm, balmy, dinner outside. And what happened was, 2 o'clock in the morning, a 60 or 70 mile per hour, winds whipped over the mountains, whipped down La Carriere, and took off about half of the flowers, which at that point in the year were just beginning to set. So we lost a lot at that point. The vines push, they re-push, they re -push twice. And so we didn't lose it all, but we did actually lose quite a lot. But the, this year, the quality has been absolutely outstanding. So, uh, La Carrière. Now, that's the terroir. I mean, I ask you, could anything grow in that? Well, just try it and see what you think. Let me just add that the, uh, for those of you who don't live in the country, the animals displayed on the previous slide are all on the endangered species list. And they are not Peter's pets. Uh, <laughs> But it gives you an idea of how, of how wild it is in, in parts of California that come real close to uh, man reaching out into wilderness. The pouring order today, most of us were taught you taste white wines before red wines, and that's, that's something that's gone by the wayside over the years. So what you see before you is a Chardonnay, and then we have a Pinot Noir, and then a Sauvignon Blanc, and two Cabernets. To me, this wine is, is, is rich and layered. It is beginning to develop some secondary characteristics. By that, I mean a little bit of honey and graham cracker nuance. Uh, all of Sir Peter's wines are quite rich and, and dense. Uh, you know, when people talk about terroir and expression of sight, what trumps that is quality. The wine has to really be good to, to have it matter where it was grown or how it was grown or, or how it was made. And, uh, and Nick Morlay has just done a phenomenal job. Peter's had a, a, a great team of winemakers over the year. Uh, for me, this is, this is beginning to, to be at a great stage of drinking. I don't like to age my wines a long time. I like my friends to. I have questions about the upside, but it's a matter of personal taste. And, and as, you, as you grow as a, as a wine connoisseur, it's important to decide at what point do you like the wines. Do you like them younger, or do you like them more developed? And so this wine has, has the what I call the transitional flavors going from you still taste the primary fruit, but then also you get some of the secondary flavors that are beginning to develop. Okay, th well, thank you very much. Now, this was planted in uh, 1994, this particular wine. And um, it, I, like, I like them young and these beautiful women. Um, incidentally, one of them, at, at this point, 
when I first produced this, I needed, I needed encouragement because if anyone realizes just how long this takes from scratch, and I bought the patch of land, which was a 650 acres, uh, it was a square mile, but I tur it turned out that that was only the down payment. And a bit like marriage, the installments came later. I didn't realize <laughs> that I was going to see break even 15 years later. And if anyone thinks that this was a, a business guy just dumping a bit of money into a sort of hobby, forget it. Now, this has been a roller coaster ride for me. It's had periods of great concern where you have to live with the unknown for years. And at the end of it, you just hope and pray that something is going to come out of it, which makes the whole journey worthwhile. In this wine, I'm very happy with that. So, so of course, Burgundy, Europe, Burgundy, I, I loved Burgundy. I love all the wines. The wines we are interested in, mountain vineyards, classical winemaking, which means the foundation of any teller will be Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, the noble grapes, etc. And so the only thing I'm really interested in doing is to produce great noble grape wines. And there's a little bit more on that I'll just mention in a minute, because, of course, when I came here, really, there were very, very, very little Burgundy Pinot Noir was grown. Tiny, tiny amount was grown. So um, we, we looked around. We tried to grow Pinot Noir on Knights Valley Estate, but it's just the wrong terroir. We did it for a few years, and it just didn't get anywhere. So we settled down and started looking and where we're going to go. And eventually, we found that we could find a place where we weren't the first visitors, oh no, but we traveled 30 miles west to uh, um, Seaview, one ridge in from the mountain, from the, from the Pacific, uh, and into a clay soil for Red Burgundy, and started trying to build vineyards. Well, <laughs> hostility perhaps is the word that happened then. Hostility came from uh, six or eight regulatory authorities who are designed to stop anything happening anywhere. Um, really good for the commercial development of the USA wine industry. And also, we had hostility from the neighbors. Now, we couldn't work out why the neighbors didn't like us until we realized that this was another great patch of cash crop. And we were getting in the way. So we nevertheless, it took years. We had to break down this resistance of the authorities, which was really tough work. And we're nothing if not persistent. And we got to the stage where we managed to acquire, uh, it's a 400-acre piece, and we got 30 acres in total. And we created three new uh, Pinot Noirs. We'd already had some success with the Santa Lucia Highlands, um, the Moulin Rouge, which we'd grown for some years. And we didn't own that, but we owned this. And our determination was, in the future, we wanted to own, farm, grow, control the process from the beginning to the end as much as we could. But this is Burgundy terroir. So um, the left-hand one is uh, uh, Clos de Ciel. The middle one is Le Caprice, and Mardin says, on the right-hand side. Now, this is steep. It doesn't show it there, but it's, it's very steep. And the next slide, I think, just gives you a bit of an idea of it, um, the slope. And here you may be able to see the bird netting. Bird netting in that territory is mandatory. Otherwise, they just go. The seabirds are very hungry, and so are the other birds. So we weren't there first there. And the next woman, really, that influenced the future of the future and the project was the lady on the left, a notable, talented, celebrated woman who was our winemaker in the very early days. I think I had the honor of giving her and the pleasure of giving her her first job. And of course, uh, she's gone on to great things at Marcus and our neighbors. 
a good wood shot will loft a ball into her, into her great uh, Pinot Noir uh, vineyard and uh, Marcassan. And she undoubtedly set the original style of the, of the winery. I simply said to her, look, Helen, I only want to do this if you can do one thing. I want to be able to put bottles of the wine that we make here on the table in the UK with my friends for dinner in the company of the great wines I have from Bordeaux and Burgundy in my cellar. And she said, oh yeah, well, fine, yeah. <laughs> so off we went.